Hello readers, I'm David Ruder and welcome to the final booktube video of 2023 of The Avid Reader. So in this video I'm gonna talk about my last reading wrap-up for 2023, so the books I've read from mid-October to end of December or so. I'm also gonna talk about a couple of recent DNFs. I'm gonna mention my five favorite and least favorite books of the year. Then I'm gonna look back at my 2023 TBR, which I stated in a live stream last year. Then we're gonna talk about my 2024 TBR, and then we're gonna briefly talk about the general channel plan for the future. So without further ado, let's get into the reading wrap up. So one book I've finished reading is The Kaiser's Web by Steve Barry, which is a political fiction, political thriller style book, which is about an election in present day Germany, basically, between a populist, far right kind of guy, and a moderate, so called patriot. But there's also this plot with looking at Martin Bormann escaping to Argentina or Chile and who produced a child with Eva Braun and someone important in politics in Germany might be related to that. So I'm not gonna spoil the ending, but yeah, it's, an, it's a good thriller. It's a bit of a straw man of populism. But apart from that, it's a good political thriller. So that's a, Steve Berry writes well, I can say that. And this book takes place among other places, Germany, South America and South Africa. The next book I, uh, I read was La Geopolitique by Pascal Boniface. So this is a, just an introduction to geopolitics by a French author. And it introduces geopolitics, talks about different conflicts around the world and talks about possible future geopolitical question. It was a short book, couple hundred pages. I enjoyed that book. It was a bit basic, but I still learned a lot of stuff since there are so many different conflicts. So I learned some stuff about the conflict in Mali, the Sahel. Then I read a Swedish book called The Kapitalistiska Manifested by Johan Norberg. This is basically a book in favor of capitalism and it breaks down and debunks all of the present day arguments against capitalism that you have. So for example, it looks at how you can solve climate change through capitalism or market based solutions. It looks at it looks at how trade with China is actually good to keep our relations decently stable. It talks about the myth of the American golden age in the 1950s, 60s, and that, that actually it wasn't that great. It shows how living standards, because we have a degree of capitalism, have incredibly increased in the past 30 years. So yeah, as a classical liberal, I appreciated reading this book a lot. And even though it's a Swedish book, there's an English translation, by the way. Next book, which might be my favorite fiction book of the year, is Welcome to the Honyam Dong Bookshop by Wang Boram. So this is originally a Korean book translated by someone from Singapore. This was a very reflective read for me. If you're a book lover and you like bookshops, you're also gonna like this book because you basically follow the story of someone opening up an independent bookshop. There's also someone in the bookshop who handles the coffee shop. You meet the bean roaster and you get to understand the dynamics of how it is to run an independent bookshop. And also, this is an analogy for do whatever you want with your life. So if you have a passion for something, you should eventually do it. And don't feel pressure all the time to speed run your life, basically. This was a very reflective read for me. And I appreciated this book a lot. And as I'm someone who's become very interested in South Korea, because I enjoy Korean movies, music, and TV shows, it was fun to read a Korean book, although of course this book is a lot more serious than other Korean media I've seen usually. So yeah, definitely a, an amazing read. I gave it five stars on Goodreads, by the way. Next book I read, which came out this year, is The Loom of Time by Robert Kaplan. And this is basically a geopolitics book about the greater Middle East. And the greater Middle East includes North Africa, the Near East, so starting in Greece, Turkey, the traditional Middle East, so the Arab Peninsula, but also South Asia, the Muslim areas there, all the way here up to Central Asia and Xinjiang. And there are individual chapters on Egypt, several chapters on Syria and Iraq. There's a chapter on Ethiopia, Turkey, Greece, 
This is a very reflective book by Robert Kaplan and it's a culmination of his previous work. And he talks also about his regret of supporting the Iraq war. He talks about a lot of different famous authors. So he talks about Edward Gibbon, Toynbee, Saad's Orientalism. So yeah, it's an interesting book, although it's heavy at times and sometimes he just goes on and on too much about ancient authors. I mean, I read Kaplan for the modern geopolitics and the recent contemporary history and it's a decent balance and overall it's a really good book if you want to learn about present day greater middle eastern geopolitics and how you have for example the arab monarchies who are progressing and reforming a lot and liberalizing without democratizing then you should read this book you also have the important concept in this book of the loom of time where you actually have gradual progress although we might not notice it next up i read the origins of political order by francis Fukuyama. Francis Fukuyama is of course the famous guy who wrote The End of History and the Last Man, which is a concept that is actually a lot truer than most people who deride it think. And the origins of political order is basically a history of political development. And there are three aspects to political development, the state, the rule of law and accountability, which basically means effective government, a government that's bound by laws, and the government that's accountable in a democratic sense. And this is a long read, so it's a bit under 500 pages, but it's written in small letters. And Francis Fukuyama starts talking about the tribal societies originally that we had before the emergence of states. Then he talks about the state a lot with China first, ancient China, the first effective state with a bureaucracy that emerged in the world that could be classified as modern by the criteria of Max Weber is actually ancient China over 2000 years ago and you had the system of the meritocratic exam system and then he also talks about the meritocratic uh, slave soldier system among the Mamluks and the Ottomans. He also talks about how you had the rule of law in a sense in India very early on since you had all these different caste systems. The top echelons of Indian culture was always the priesthood and not the warrior class so the warrior class never had absolute power then the rule of law in europe actually emerged because you had this separation between church and state and that separation emerged in the 11th century with the schism between the holy roman emperor and the pope and the pope ba basically declared independence from the european kings and got control of his own church lands and got the right to appoint bishops. It was an idea that certain laws of Europe, they are not to be tampered with by secular rulers. They are to be decided by religion who are just interpreting the laws. So Christian Catholics. Then you also have the development of political accountability and the rule of law in England that actually goes back a long time. So you can date property rights even for women back to the 13th, 12th century or something like that. And you already had local democratic accountability where you had kind of an equality before the law between nobles and peasants. And you had the emergence of the king's courts and the common law. And then people could go there instead of going to their lord's courts. So the king was actually much more fair in his uh, judicial rulings than the lords. So you had the emergence of the state in that way, but you still had a balance of power between the king and the nobles and the gentry and the merchants. And that's culminated in the glorious revolution where you had the English Bill of Rights, where the king was accountable to parliament, which was both made up of the House of Lords and the House of Commons. And the House of Commons did have quite some influence and because you had this good balance of power where the king still retained some power it did not descend into bad oligarchy like happened in hungary where you had the nobles who would oppress the peasants and would not pay for the defense which led them to be conquered by the ottomans and then towards the end of the book he kind of hints at the next book in this series which is political order and political decay so fukuyama argues that there's an inherent conservatism in institutions, which means that when you have a dynamic world and you have stagnant institutions, you have political decay and then that society might die out. So I'm definitely looking forward to reading the sequel of this book next year. By the way, I'm recording this video on the 20th of December. I don't expect that I will read any other books before the end of this year.
So the final book of this year I think is going to be Gunpowder Empire by Harry Tudelove, which is Harry Tudelove's take at young adult. And so this is slightly under 300 pages on like his big books of 600 pages, 500 pages. You have this series he's written called Cross Time Traffic, which is basically guys who are in our home timeline that are slightly more advanced than us presently. They have this technology to teleport to alternate worlds. We had different alternate history scenarios. So here you had Agrippa become the second Roman emperor. You had the Romans get gunpowder. So the Romans in this book are gunpowder empire, like the Mughals and the Safavids and the Ottoman empires in our early modern history was. So you have basically the Roman empire that has stagnated at early modern history stage. So it's an interesting book because you actually have modern day teenagers who are living in a place that have ancient customs and values. So you can see they're disgusted by the use of slavery and that you're in a dictatorship. And also they're really disgusted for some reason about people wearing animal fur. These teenagers are at times a bit annoying, but apart from that, it's a decent read. A bit repetitive at times, but still, Decent Alternate History by Harry Jodelov. I think I'm gonna read more of the Cross Time Traffic series. So, having talked about the books I've read this year, let's talk about my two recent DNFs. So, the first one was Pompeii by Robert Harris, which is a book about the explosion of that volcano next to Pompeii in ancient Rome. But the thing is, the, most of the story is before the volcano explodes itself. So it's basically just historical fiction of ancient Rome. And I like reading about ancient Rome once the Republic. The, the empire of Rome actually kind of disgusts me with the aristocrats thinking you're better than everyone and then you have slaves and things like that. So the thing I liked with Gunpowder Empire is that you actually got the present day perspective. The historical fiction of Pompeii just felt uh, unrelatable. So yeah, that's why I DNF'd it after reading about 100 pages or so. And that's the first Robert Harris book I didn't really enjoy and that I've DNF'd. All the other ones I've read so far have been good books at least. Another book I DNF'd was The Dawn of Eurasia by Bruno Marques, who's an ex-European minister from Portugal. But the thing is, there's no coherent narrative that's strong. He just goes on and talks about different high-minded concepts and he also is going on a trip throughout the world but it's not well written like Robert Kaplan so I did learn a couple of interesting things reading this book initially but after 100 pages or so I just gave up because it was a painful read and geopolitics is supposed to be kind of entertaining and this book wasn't oddly. Now I've talked about the two DNFs recently so I'm gonna talk about my favorite and least favorite books of the year. So of course, among my favorite, I have to include Welcome to the Honyam Dong Bookshop. This novel has really gotten me interested in reading about East Asian contemporary fiction, especially from Japan and South Korea. It's a perfect combo for me, this book, because it's about South Korea, which is a country that's very interesting to me. And it's a bookshop, which as an avid reader, of course, I'm gonna love reading about that and it's gonna relate to a lot of the things here. But you also just have the regularness of life and how it is to live as a person in our modern society. It was kind of a cathartic read this book. So I know this is mainly a geopolitics history related focus channel, but if you really want to read some amazing fiction, you should definitely check this book out. Welcome to the Honyam Dong Bookshop by Wang Bo Run. Another novel I really liked was Fort Pillow by Harry Tudelop, which is a novel about the American Civil War and the Battle of Fort Pillow, where you had the Confederates storming the fort, and then they massacred a bunch of American soldiers, including a lot of blacks. There's about half of the American unit there was black soldiers. So that was an interesting nuanced read and also very entertaining Harry Tudelop's Civil War story. And Harry Tudelop is at his best when he writes about the American Civil War and its aftermath. Next up, a non-fiction book I really liked was The Thomas Sowell Reader by Thomas Sowell. So I read a lot of Thomas Sowell books this year, five. And I don't know if I'm gonna read any more Thomas Sowell books since I've read so many and covered a lot of topics. But The Thomas Sowell Reader basically is a good introduction to everything Thomas Sowell and covers a wide variety of topics. So history, social issues, economic issues, race, 
yeah, just amazing book overall. And also it has a little biographical section about Thomas Sowell's writings. Also just some random Sowell quotes at the end of the book. So yeah, if you want to get into Thomas Sowell, definitely start with the Thomas Sowell reader. Most of the little essays in that book are just a few pages long. Next is another Thomas Sowell book. It's The Housing Boom and Bust. And it talks about the Great Recession and how it was basically caused by the government really pressurizing agencies to make bad home loans to people and then you had a boom of this and people just betting and taking out bigger and bigger loans and investing into housing but these were bad loans delinquent loans that true financial creativity or whatever that's called try to pretend oh no these loans are good and then you had the result of the great recession and the housing bust so yeah if you want to learn about the great recession and have an honest take on it that just doesn't go oh oh it's capitalism fault this is proof that capitalism doesn't work even though it has nothing to do with free markets really the housing boom and bust so that's a good economics book housing boom and bust by thomas Sol. next up is the swedish book the capitalistiska manifested so as i'm at university of course there's a left-wing bias here and i had an economic history course here called 500 years of globalization which was overall decently fair in presenting all views but still it blamed the great recession on capitalism and how free markets are screwing up some things in the last 30 years so yeah this was a good refresher reassuring me of my political principles which means that if you're a classical liberal you're gonna like that book the capitalist manifesto of course then let's talk about the five worst books i read this year some of which has caused me to read a lot less of alternate history now and fiction in general so first off you have the plot against america by philip roth which is you know charles Lindbergh wins the 1940 american election instead of franklin delano roosevelt then creates a kind of fascist nazi state that so-called prosecutes Jews but the story is really badly executed where nothing happens to the Jews 80% of the book and then last 50 pages something happens to the Jews and you have a penultimate chapter that finishes the story but then you have a final chapter that's just redundant and boring and you have unlikable characters in this book and people just strawmanning what Republicans are in the United States in this book so yeah I did not like this book. Then you had the next 100 years by George Friedman, which predicts what's going to happen in the next 100 years and was already wrong by predicting that China will collapse in 2020 or 2010, which didn't happen. China is not doing that great, but it's doing all right. And it also predicts that there's going to be a war between Poland and Japan and Turkey, which come on. No. Yeah, reading Peter Zeehan and George Friedman has kind of soured me on Stratford. And next up are two Peter Zeehan books that I really did not like that I read this year. So you have This United Nations and The End of the World is Just the Beginning. So This United Nations is the worst one because it's just a bad rehashing of his previous two books, which are The Accidental Superpower and The Absent Superpower. And yeah, he just repeats himself and writes it in more word salad words. But yeah, just the claims that Peter Zian makes in general are crazy. Like in the end of the world, in just the beginning, he basically says, in a few years, we're going to have a famine that kills 1 billion people and have serious malnutrition, which no. And he basically says that half the world is going to hell. So he claims that America, parts of Southeast Asia, France, countries like that are going to be fine. But then China, Russia, large parts of Europe like Germany are screwed, which I read a lot of geopolitics. I also do an international relations specialization and minor at university no one in international relations takes peter zian seriously which yeah should tell you about his credentials he doesn't cite anything that he claims he shows some charts sometimes and then in the acknowledgments he says oh go to these websites to find my claims but he doesn't cite anything directly i'm not gonna do the work myself and look up his sources that's his job not mine Thinking back on it, I don't even think it's worth to read any Peter Zian book in general. I'm even starting to question whether he's right about Russia. Maybe he is, that's possible. But on pretty much everything else, I'm pretty sure he's wrong. We had deglobalization to a certain extent, but still it's continuing and you have cooperation around the world about climate change now and you still have extensive trade between different countries and you still have china and the west trying to coexist and collaborate economically nowadays so yeah you're not gonna have peter zian's prediction of the world descending into hell and chaos because of 
some things linked to demographics and energy and geography. No, we have trade for a reason to help mitigate a lot of these problems. And by the way, most countries have recovered their GDP rate from COVID. So the COVID recession that Peter Sian basically predicted would be permanent for a lot of countries. It wasn't. You still have countries industrializing around the world that are developing, which Peter Sian claimed wouldn't happen. So yeah. So those were my five least favorite books of the year. So now let's talk about how I did on my 2023 TBR. So I had the live stream last year in December where I claimed that I was going to read a certain number of books from different genres. So Thomas Sowell, alternate history, global politics and historical fiction. So I did pledge 29 specific books that I was going to read. And of these, I read 17 of them and I failed to read 12 of them. And I also said I was going to read some other books, but nothing specific. So the books I completed on my TBR are The New Map, State Building, The Next 100 Years, The Israel Lobby and US Foreign Policy, This United Nations, The End of the World is Just the Beginning, Monsoon, Days of Infamy, Through Darkest Europe, Three Miles Down, The Yiddish Policeman's Union, The Plot Against America, The Thomas Sowell Reader, Fall of Giants, Pirate Latitudes, Conclave and The Kaiser's Web. And then the books I failed to read on my 2023 TBR are the Dawn of Eurasia, A Crucible of Nations, Asia's Reckoning, End of the Beginning, The War That Came Early, Hitler's War, The Years of Rice and Salt, Hitler's Peace, Conquistador, Wealth, Poverty and Politics, Applied Economics, The Fear Index, and Blackouts. So some of the books I failed to read, I have no intentions of reading, so I either DNF them or don't want to continue the series. And then others I'm going to read eventually probably, but I don't know when. Although one of these books I have pledged on my TBR for next year. So let's move on to my 2024 TBR. So for my geopolitics TBR, I have pledged six books for 2024. And I thought that I would kind of have an Asian team next year. So first of all, you have, of course, Asia's Reckoning, The Struggle for Global Dominance by Richard McGregor, which talks about East Asian recent history and geopolitics. And it's also recommended by Robert Kaplan. So yeah, I hope to read this next year although i didn't read it this year or although i was supposed to so we'll see and i also can see that it's recommended by the south china morning post which is a hong kong newspaper and also the japan times so hopefully it doesn't suck like dawn of eurasia <coughs> ship wars by chris miller this is a book that my father read and he strongly recommends for me and it talks about yeah the importance of chips as technology in our future geopolitics it's recommended among others by Niall Ferguson and Daniel Yergin. So this should be a good follow-up on the book, The New Map. I look forward to learning about the strategic importance of chips and how that ties to the dynamics between China and Taiwan. Next up, you have a Robert Kaplan book, which I got in The Hague earlier this year, The Return of Marco Polo's World by Robert Kaplan. And this is Robert Kaplan's second essay collection. So I've already read one essay collection by Robert Kaplan, The Coming Anarchy. That essay collection was a decent one, but this one should be interesting. I think it also talks about the rise of China and also about multipolarity. And he talks about the role of America in future geopolitics. So yeah, Robert Kaplan, always an interesting author. So I may read other Robert Kaplan books next year, but I certainly want to read this one. Next up, you have the Grand Chessboard by this big new Brzezinski. And Brzezinski was the national security advisor under the Carter administration and was very anti-Soviet. And this book has been talked about in many other geopolitics books I've read. So yeah, I really want to read this book for next year. The subtitle here is American Primacy and its Geostrategic Imperatives. This book was written originally back in the 90s, although there's an updated epilogue in this book. So I can actually see whether Brzezinski's predictions or strategies that he talked about in the 90s are actually still applicable in the 2020s. Next book you have is The Digital Silk Road by I think Jonathan Hillman, which I think talks about China's involvement in tech and AI and blockchains and things like that, which is an important subject nowadays. I mean, my university even has a class and a program that you can study now called Artificial Intelligence. And then the final geopolitics book I'm pledging for next year is The Great Conversions by Kishore Mahbubani, which is a Singaporean author and diplomat. And it talks about the rise of countries like India, 
and China and how they're economically converging with the United States. So that should be an interesting read and also from a more Eastern perspective as all these other books are basically books written by Westerners. Now let's move on to the history books I'm gonna read. So you have the Ministry of Future and the subtitle is a biography of George Orwell's 1984 and I believe it looks at the background of writing 1984 by George Orwell and then it looks at the world after 1984 and I think it maybe looks at history and whether the totalitarianism predicted by Orwell is applicable in any ways today. So that should be a fascinating read. I've had this book for a few years now. I really like George Orwell as an author and I love 1984. So this should be a good nonfiction book on the subject. Next up, you have Embattled Rebel by James McPherson, which is a history book about the Civil War, but from the perspective of the Confederate president, Jefferson Davis. So of course, over time, my views on the Civil Wars have become more and more pro-American, but it still should be interesting to get the Confederate perspective of this war, as it's not exactly black and white, as some people like to pretend. Next book is Political Order and Political Decay by Francis Fukuyama, so the sequel of the origins of political order, and it basically looks at political development from the French Revolution up to the present day. I'm sure I'll learn a lot of interesting political science by reading this book and I've watched a bunch of recent lectures and interviews with Francis Fukuyama and he's really an interesting guy to listen to and he's a very underrated author Francis Fukuyama. And next history book I want to read is Doom by Niall Ferguson. So I own several books by Ferguson. I've only read one but I want to read several so if I have to read one next year I think it's Doom because that's Ferguson's history of pandemics and it also talks about Covid and how people reacted in a bad way and that they're always over doomerists and that you often have two extremes which leads to ineffective government responses to pandemics and crises and famines and things like that so it should be an interesting history book. Now we're gonna move on to some fiction books. So first up, you have The Dead Zone by Stephen King, which is a favorite Stephen King book on booktube often. So I look forward to reading this novel. It's made up of a bunch of genres. Hope all the hype is justified. It's about a guy who gets some premonition superpower. Next up, we have Rising Sun by Michael Crichton, which is a crime novel, but that also deals with Japanese-American business relations, I think, during the 80s or 90s, which should be interesting. It allows me more to learn about Japanese culture. Next fiction book I want to read is the sci-fi book Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, which is a sci-fi classic and also apparently quite comedic, which could be good in my life to get some more comedy. Then there's the sequel to Gunpowder Empire, so Curious Notions by Harry Trudelov which is cross-time traffic, but instead of in Rome, you have cross-time traffic or the German Empire, I think, wins World War I. So that should be an interesting scenario. Alternate history is usually the Germans winning World War II. Here it's World War I. And then the final fiction book I'm pledging here is Norwegian Wood by Haruki Murakami, which is a Japanese author. And as I've said, I want to learn more about East Asia. And I think reading fiction could be a good way. The plot here sounds interesting. It sounds like a melancholic read of people having regrets of their childhood and reflecting back. I'm not exactly sure what the novel is about, but the plot from what I know sounds interesting. And maybe through this book I can get into Haruki Murakami. Who knows? Then there are a couple of other English books I'm pledging. So you have Upheaval by Jared Diamond, how nations cope with crisis and change. So I had started to read Guns, Germs and Steels, but it's a lot about pre-modern history, so it's boring for me but this deals much more with modern history. There is a section on Chile, Finland, and then a final section with several chapters on America and its futures. So hopefully more interesting and up-to-date than guns, germs, and steel, and hopefully also less deterministic. Then we have the book um, Calling BS, The Art of Skepticism in a Data-Driven World. So this just encourages you to be skeptic and lays out a bunch of fallacies that we have relating to data nowadays. So this should be a read that's relevant for today. It reminds me a bit of the concept of economic facts and fallacies by Thomas Sowell. Then there are three Swedish books I want to read. So first of all, you have Historian om Sverige by Hermann Lindqvist. So Hermann Lindqvist is a big Swedish author, Swedish historian. He's written a lot of 
history books, so I want to maybe get into his history books. I've actually got another book by him that's signed by him, so that's pretty cool. But this is his History of Sweden. It's a big book between six and 700 pages, written in relatively small text, so this should take a while to read. And as someone with Swedish heritage and interested in learning about the development of Swedish liberal democracy, this should be an interesting read, and only the first 100 pages or so are actually about history up to the Middle Ages, which is great. Most of this book is about modern Swedish history. So this is what I would be reading over the Christmas break. Then I want to read also a book called The Falna Imperiet, which is a book about Russia under Putin and the decreasing Russian Empire and its decay and decline. And then there's a book called Finland's Historia, so a history of Finland by Henrik Meinander, which is a big Finnish historian. So as I'm also someone who's half Finnish, I'm interested also in learning about Finland's history. Then let's move on to some French books. So I have an intention of eventually maybe moving to Canada. I speak French, but I need to improve my French. So it would be good to read some more French books. So I have put four books here to read. So first you have Le Tour du Monde en 80 jours by Jules Verne. So I actually have that book in French. And it's a book about yeah, a guy going around the world in 80 days, which in the 19th century was a cool new concept of sci-fi, which is a French liberal who just basically makes fun of French society and politics back in the 18th century or 17th century through fiction. Then you have La Princesse de Babylon, which is a book by Voltaire, which is also a French liberal. I've already read one non-fiction book by Voltaire, which was so-and-so, but his fiction may be better. And then there, finally, there's the book Nouvelle France, which is a history book about Quebec and my heritage in Canada is actually from Quebec specifically so it would be good to learn about the history of the French Canadian people also since I'm technically French Canadian. So yeah those are the 24 books that I'm pledging for next year. I have a feeling I'm gonna be reading a lot less books next year than this year and previous years. The reason for that is because I have less free times so my chores have gone up where I live. I also have a longer commute. I also have a larger study load now because I'm in the honors program I have also a lot more active social life nowadays because I hang out with the honors association doing all of these things even if I have free time I have less energy some sometimes I don't have the energy to read I might just watch some k-drama or listen to some music instead and relax so yeah I'm only pledging 24 books next year to not overwhelm myself that's about two books a month I'll probably read more books than 24 books but I'm not gonna play some crazy book goal on Goodreads, like a lot of people. I actually put goals that are achievable in my life, usually. You may have seen some YouTube posts that are changing up the makeup of the channel, and you may have seen that the channel art has also changed. Next year, you can expect about one video a month. So on the last Sunday of each month, that's when videos will come out. And those videos will pro either probably be reading wrap-ups or geopolitics book reviews. I might also mix it up with some other video, who knows. That's just to maintain a good balance between reading and the channel and my life in general. So I'm optimistic about next year and I wish everyone a happy new year as this video is coming out on New Year's Eve. Otherwise, I'll see you in 2024 and I will see you readers next time.